Dear colleagues, we are happy to announce uh, today our ninth NOL practitioner under the spotlight. And our speaker today is Frederick Van Bulehe. I guess that I pronounced it correctly, sorry. So we are happy that Frederick is willing to present uh, the informal meeting of this series and he will share his local, national and international experience in open educational resources and tell us about the career that took him there. Uh, for those who do not know him so far, uh, we will uh, briefly introduce him. Frederick has been working for KU Leuven Library since the year 2004, and first as a deputy librarian on the campus library in Kortnik, and since the year 2010 as a head of this branch library. He's a member of the management team of KU Leuven Libraries and has been involved in several projects concerning information literacy teaching, learning center development, quality management, and strategic planning. He is responsible for developing educational support services in KU Leuven Libraries. He learned about the activities of NOL and became a member in the year 2019. Inspired by the Open Educational Resource Movement, he introduced Open Educational Resources as a focus for the library strategic plan in KU Leuven. This webinar will focus on the recent activities and uh, the results in advocating of open educational resources in KU Leuven. So, Frederick, the floor is yours. You're welcome. Yes, thank you very much for this introduction, Elena. My name is indeed Frederick van Doolage, and I work for KU Leuven, KU Leuven Library since 2004. And yeah, I have to be honest that I was a little bit reluctant for this under the spotlight session. Uh, Monique and Paolo had to insist a little bit, uh, but I also must admit that that's one of their many talents. So they convinced me easily. It's not that I don't want to share my experiences with the community, but it's rather that I believe that my experience is not very big. Um, I've been supporting education throughout my career as one of my responsibilities, and I've also been involved in several projects, but it's only recently that I focused on open education and open educational uh, resources. And that was in the period that we were preparing our new strategic uh, plan for the library, and that was during the dark years of COVID. In Belgium, education and culture is a regional political responsibility, and up until now, there's no real explicit policy that stimulates OER in higher education. And KU Leuven is very active in open education, mainly concerning MOOCs, uh, but we are not really moving fast when it comes to open sharing of uh, educational resources. But it's a reality that things evolve at different paces in different contexts, in different countries, in different institutions, and that even small experience or progress can be very interesting to share with the community. So I hope that this session uh, can still be interesting for other annual members and that uh, that might be in a similar situation. So this under the spotlight will not focus on big national or regional projects to stimulate open education. It will be about trying to get things moving. When the stars are not aligned, uh, searching for small chances and opportunities, just trying and working together. So in the first uh, part, I will uh, tell something about my uh, previous experiences. And in the second part, then I will uh, focus on our strategic plan for the library and how we are now uh, working about uh, OER in our institution. First, something about myself. Um, I started my professional career as a deputy librarian for the Kortrijk campus of Kaya Leuven. And Kortrijk is not Leuven, of course. It's a city in the west of Flanders. It's about 60 kilometers away from Ghent and about 135 kilometers away from Leuven. Actually, 
with the train connection to Lille and the Eurostar train. And considering the traffic jams in Brussels, London isn't, isn't that much further away than Leuven. Um, in 1965, there was a special legislation in Flanders uh, which allowed Kai Leuven to start a university campus in Kortrijk. And so from that moment on, the province of West Flanders finally also had a university. And the Kulak is a small, comprehensive uh, campus with bachelor programs uh, of six, fac six faculties of Kai Leuven. And students can start the bachelor program in Kortrijk and then continue the master program in uh, Leuven. I also did uh, almost uh, yeah, 25 years ago. I must say at the time, I was very happy to start my career in my hometown um, at the university campus that I know so well. And almost 20 years later, I never felt the, the need for change. So again, not a big impressive career story of traveling the world, finding for uh, the perfect job. But in Flanders, we have our own complexities. The Kulak was the first campus outside Leuven, but that situation changed drastically in two, uh, 2014 when the university evolved to a multi-campus university with campuses in uh, 12 cities in Flanders. And that was also the case for the library. We now have uh, library locations all over Flanders and the governance of those small libraries was no easy task. There were uh, libraries that were integrated in Kaya Leuven libraries. Some were part of a faculty organization and some campus libraries have their own governance. But we all work together as Kaya Leuven libraries and we also work uh, together on a common strategic plan. And additionally, the library also had a strong partnership called the Kaya Leuven Association. And uh, also on that level, the libraries seek cooperation. So this means that we operate in a multi-level organization with projects, networks, and collaborations on different levels, the campus level, the Kaya Leuven libraries level, and also the level of the association uh, of Kaya Leuven. And in my first years as a deputy, my deputy librarian, my focus was really on learning center development. And also I was practically teaching information literacy for all students on campus. And I also immediately got involved in working groups and networks of KU Leuven Library and the Association of KU Leuven. And afterwards, I realized that some of those experiences uh, and projects were actually practical experiences about challenges in uh, sharing learning materials, collaboration about learning materials, and also openness of information. And I want to illustrate these early experiences with two examples and two projects that I was involved with. So the, the first example is a project where we uh, worked together to create a to a tutorial about information literacy. And I think almost all libraries uh, in a, at a certain point uh, worked, uh, worked around uh, creating a tutorial. And in 2004 and 2005, two of our branch libraries independently from each other created an open online tutorial about uh, information literacy one for arts and literature and one for science and technology. And both tutorials were openly available and online. And um, because they were open, they didn't go unnoticed. So we soon had a collaboration about these tutorials. Um, and we, are, we, we started working together and we asked the question, shouldn't we have a joint tutorial for all Kai Leuven libraries? And can other libraries or for instance, libraries of the Association of uh, Kai Leuven also use and reuse these tutorials? So in the end, we decided to create a tutorial together, but collaboration is easier said than done. In our pursuit to uh, create a tutorial to cater, that could cater to all disciplines, academic levels, and also affiliated institutions, we, in the end, opted for a more generic approach and we realized a collectively designed uh, core tutorial. We called it Mother Tutorial um, that could be uh, tweaked and reused by all partners. So in reality, it became a shared and adaptable uh, educational resource. But in that process, um, it was no longer open. We uh, kind of decided to... Uh, developed this new tutorial in the official learning environment, uh, the Toledo environment, and by doing so, it was no longer openly available. We made this choice uh, at the time because we wanted the tutorial to be used as an official evaluation tool, making also use of the grade center uh, in the learning environment. So it's also clear that at the time, I wasn't uh, as radical about open as I am nowadays. Uh, so. In the end, the project uh, ended and all partners started to use and adapt the, the tutorial uh, to their own needs. 
And many years later, I think in 2018, uh, we decided that we should rework that tutorial. And uh, then it came to light that the stakeholders had long abandoned that shared tutorial and although it was still available. So this uh, early project learned me a few points about uh, things we, we still face, we are still facing when we try to uh, open up educational materials nowadays. First of all, open is obviously the best way to uh, uh, promote learning materials and to trigger collaboration. Uh, this project started with open tutorials and we started working together. Uh, uh, so that open is just the best way to start collaboration and cooperation. But on the other hand, uh, after the cooperation, we ended up with closed resources. So uh, the resources that are designed in, in institutional context, um, yeah, to, to, to stimulate use of those resources, you have to use the, 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 the portals that are available and that doesn't always stimulate open publishing. Secondly, learning materials are by its nature designed for specific needs for, of learners and are not created uh, from the beginning as a publication. Uh, so uh, also the original tutorials were created for a specific target group and the amount of changes that were needed to adapt the tutorial were huge and uh, a, a material that is shared can always serve as an inspiration of course to others but I also keep wondering how many OERs in uh, current OER repositories are actually being reused. Some success stories about reuse could really help to inspire lecturers to share their own uh, resources. And thirdly, there is an, uh, this is also an example of the importance of curation. We worked together, we created the mother tutorial, but in the end, collaboration faded and uh, the material was outdated and nobody took responsibility to note or mark the tutorial as outdated. And um, when we engage teachers in searching for learning materials, for instance, in OER repositories, I noticed that uh, the number of outdated materials or dead links is, is not really helping. So we are still, um, I think, uh, we still encounter the same issues that we uh, encountered in, uh, uh, I think that project started in 2005. So it's, it's already a long time ago, but the same issues are still, I think, very important. We had, by the way, a similar project about uh, also about information literacy, it was called, and I will use a little bit of Dutch, uh, OOF project, project Delen van Leerobjecten voor Informatievaardigheden. So this, this project was actually an application of the idea to collectively create learning materials and share them um, uh, so they could be reused by everybody who wants to uh, reuse those learning materials. Um, so the idea was yeah, learning objects about information literacy. So it was actually an idea of collaboratively creating learning objects and sharing them. Um, so the objects were, were created based on a commonly accepted standard for learning information literacy, and they resulted in uh, a, a community with presentations, tests, exercises, also learning design, design templates, and also a, a forum and a wiki to facilitate the collaboration. So although in concept, this was a really good effort, it was not really successful. There were some questions about the quality of the learning objects. Um, and there were also issues about findability and communication. And again, this was a community in the uh, digital learning environment and therefore it was not, not open. So those were a few experiences um, that I think uh, uh, when I think about them uh, afterwards are, are very applicable on uh, uh, to challenges that we still face when talking about uh, OER. But in 2010, my role changed. Um, and for, for some time, I would not be involved in educational support, I think for eight years. Uh, I got a promotion. I uh, became the head of uh, the Kaya Leuven Campus Library in Kortrijk. And I um, so um, I got some new responsibilities. And I also became a formal member of the management team of KU Leuven Libraries. And in that management team, my focus shifted 100% towards quality management. Uh, we implemented the structured uh, quality management system for KU Leuven libraries. We actively involved our users in the library doing a, a LibCore Plus survey in 2008, 2012, and 2016. And I was also uh, working around, uh, working for uh, benchmarking and statistics. It's a, a whole other world than educational support. Um, 
And of course, in that time, we also focused very hard on open access, open science, scholarly publication, RDM. And as a member of the management team, I've got, I, I got involved in these topics. So um, I got somewhat further away from education, but I got more involved with the importance of open. And um, you also see the logo of the Vlirios. And um, I also got involved in a Vlirios project uh, with the University of Cuenca in Ecuador. The Vlir is a Flemish inter-university board, and they have uh, funds for sustainable development projects with universities in the south. And these projects compose of several joint research projects concerning economic or regional development, but also uh, often a transversal project to structurally improve uh, the university. And my vice rector talked me into leading the project for the library development uh, project as part of that transversal project. And I accepted, and that was uh, an experience I will never forget. It was from 2011 until 2016. So there we also tried to work on library quality and uh, Im improve the quality of the library. But I think uh, the visit to their libraries and the reality back then was that while open, uh, here is a choice, uh, there it is uh, fundamental. It's, it's not a choice. The teaching, learning and research there was back at the time almost 100% based on open collections or older and outdated paper collections. And I know it's maybe an uh, idealistic approach, but um, that kind of um, um, increased the importance of openness uh, for me personally. So um, I said at the beginning that we are not really moving fast concerning OER, but Kai Leuven, of course, has always been pretty active and receptive towards open education. I think in 2012, Kai Leuven was the first university in Belgium to join the Open Courseware Consortium. And in 2014, the focus shifted from Open Courseware towards uh, MOOCs. And Kai Leuven also joined the uh, edX platform and now has a wide portfolio of MOOCs available uh, online. So I think. Um, while Kai Leuven is, is active in, in uh, open education, there is not really an initiative or a framework or a, a support for lecturers who would now just say, OK, I want to share my uh, uh, learning resources or educational resources openly. So um, after a few meetings, um, with this annual network and also after learning about the UNESCO recommendation, I was hesitant and I was not sure if um, we as a library yeah, can change uh, or can, can make a fundamental impact on stimulating uh, OER if there is no national policy in place. Um, so probably no, but that doesn't mean for me that we uh, cannot try to do something. So. Uh, I think thanks to the UNESCO recommendation and also the fact that OER is also more present in international library networks and also thanks to what's happening in, uh, in the Netherlands, for instance, we decided that um, OER might be a topic of interest for our strategic plan uh, because as a library, we are always allowed to advocate for open. Um, so we added OER as a topic of interest in the context of open science. And by doing so, I think we created a small playground for ourselves where we can, from which we can try to stimulate and advocate for OER without being the lone voice trying to change uh, uh, education. So that's a very... Uh, rather boring slide, but that's actually the, 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 a, a part of our now current strategic plan um, uh, and how OER is uh, introduced in our strategic plan. So as a library in the previous years, we took a leading role concerning open science and we established the library as a center of expertise concerning open science, open access, scholarly publications, and also uh, RDM. So we just uh, want to continue that leading role and while continuing our leading role in open science, we also want to try to support OER and citizen science, for instance. So we want to develop expertise and organize training for lecturers and tra training staff. And we also want to have a leading and facilitating role by offering advice, training programs, and infrastructures for OER. So you can uh, read this very much with an OER uh, uh, scope or a point of view, or you can yeah, yeah, you can uh, read it from the, the context of open science. So the way it's mentioned gives us the opportunity to give it the attention 
we think is needed, uh, but we can also slow down if uh, uh, initiatives uh, uh, were not accepted. But the plan got approved and we could uh, get to work in uh, 2022. So that's only, uh, I think, 20 months ago that the plan got approved and we started working. And one of the first things I noticed was that it is rather easy to raise the interest of librarians if you talk about opening up information. The open science spirit is already there. We had a brainstorm session about OER in our strategic working group, setting out several uh, priorities and approaches to realizing our goals. And I started with a presentation about the benefits of OER, making good use uh, of the benefits toolkit that is provided by the NOL network. And uh, our colleagues had a lot of good ideas uh, on how to reach our goals and how to work uh, on uh, OER. All the, uh, it's all in Dutch here, so I uh, summarized it in English. Uh, um, but the first thing we decided to do is work on promotion of OER, also unlocking OER. Um, creating our own OER, OER, also do an internal analysis in Kai Leuven, who is already uh, practicing opening education, and also do an external uh, evaluate analysis and look, look abroad and look at good examples. Promoting OER is, of course, a very important one. Um, and um, we got invited uh, to present about, uh, to give a presentation about open educational resources at our Open Science Task Force. Um, and that task force is actually uh, thinking about open science for uh, Kai Leuven and is not a library task force, is a, a university-wide task force. And so they wanted to know what was happening concerning open education. And they actually invited the, the co-director of educational policy and she invited me to join her. So we gave a presentation there and we focused on the opportunities, advantages, and also challenges of uh, OER. And I must say again, a lot of the academics were enthusiastic and they asked a lot of questions about the possibilities of using, adapting, translating and sharing educational resources. And uh, the task force advised us to go ahead and uh, they also asked us uh, to keep them informed about our progress. And they also stated, although it's education and it's very different from science, that the link with open science is interesting and uh, relevant. So as a follow-up of that uh, meeting, we uh, created a website about open educational resources at Kai Leuven. Um, so we gave also attention to OER examples that are already in, uh, present in our uh, organization, which is, um, for instance, an open handbook that we by accident discovered, or for instance, a professor at my campus who is an involved partner in the project about uh, anatomy tool. Uh, so we uh, created that website uh, for, uh, yeah, for, uh, in, in our Kai Leuven website. And also you see here the, uh, the visual, uh, the open science uh, task force is also creating a visual about open science and that's actually a policy visual and they decided to uh, also give uh, some space in that visual to open educational resources uh, noting the principles that it's about knowledge for all it's about reusability and sharing and it's about inclusivity and collaboration so um, this visual is not final it's still uh, under construction um, but actually that's the first um, uh, official policy statement uh, uh, about uh, OER. And the task force also decided that topics about OER can be accepted for the annual Open Science Day in Leuven. So the professor at my campus, Evi Verige, um, went to uh, that Open Science Day, the Kai Leuven Open Science Day, and gave a very inspiring uh, presentation about anatomy tool. Um, and you can find the proceedings of the Kai Leuven Open Science Day uh, online on the website. The second priority for the library was to unlock OER. Uh, almost instantly, we uh, uh, added open textbook collections to our catalog. Um, and I think we as a library can always uh, play a role to stimulate open education just by showcasing open alternatives. Uh, we can bring lecturers in contact with high quality OER. Um, in the end, we don't need 15,000 OERs about the same topic. We need 
a few very high quality OERs and then a lot of users. So quality is const continuously improved. So the focus on unlocking open information is in my opinion, a very useful focus for libraries. We can stimulate the use of expensive commercial handbooks and atlases, or we can also choose to uh, search and uh, uh, promote uh, open alternatives such as anatomy tool or a uh, qualitative open textbooks. We also started practicing what we preach uh, by trying to open up our own uh, OER. The knowledge clips we made about uh, research data management are now openly available under CC BY uh, license. And for sure, we will also up, open up our online tutorial in the future. Um, but we also learned uh, that we cannot uh, blindly jump into this. The library team also needs training. And as an external analysis, we uh, already invited our neighbors from the Netherlands. Uh, Kirsten gave a very interesting view on how OER is handled in the Netherlands um, and also about edusources.nl. But uh, this was very inspiring, but it was also very clear that the policy context there was very different. The internal analysis was also a very useful uh, reflex. We discovered some OER and we promoted them on our website, but we also now have regular meetings with educational policy, uh, with the, the, the director of educational policy. And it was soon very clear that a, a very big policy change is not to be ex 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 expected, but at the same time, by thinking about this together, we started to create connections and see opportunities. Uh, for instance, in our uh, Toledo, that's our Blackboard environment, share educational resources is not an easy feat. And uh, for more and more national and international projects, sharing of resources is necessary. For instance, some national educational projects require that the resources can be shared with lifelong learners. Or in international projects, sometimes sharing learning materials in a joint educational project is required. So we linked our analysis about the potential need for a repository with the actual current need for sharing resources with specific uh, partners. Developing an OER repository, which uh, also allows limited or internal sharing, could be an interesting step towards ev uh, to evolve towards more sharing of learning materials. The second opportunity we identified together was the need to uh, stimulate the use of OER, for instance, in the context of MOOCs. So, this kind of um, exchange of ideas resulted in a few projects. And the first project was, um, you might remember in the strategic plan, we also mentioned that we would like to investigate the need for a, um, an OER repository. It was not the plan that we would build a repository. It was just that we would make an analysis to make uh, sure if we need a repository or, or a platform or a solution and what that solution could be. Um, but um, uh, we started that project and uh, to think about the repository in, uh, uh, I think in April. And so we uh, started working with uh, user stories. So we had a, a brainstorm about possible user stories in terms of sharing educational materials. And uh, uh, an example is for instance, that it should be possible to share a, um, uh, a learning materials about introduction to mathematics with teachers of high schools, for instance, so that they can uh, share it with their students so that students can prepare for uh, mathematical courses uh, at the university. That's an example of a user story. And so um, we identified a list of learning materials that can benefit from, sh uh, from sharing. Um, but we are also aware that uh, the possibility to share it not with everybody, but with a selected group, for instance, uh, teachers or uh, institutions for lifelong learning will uh, make this project about an OER repository more complicated because uh, um, it's not possible then to just join a, a OER platform, for instance. But we have to consider this as an opportunity to stimulate uh, open. And uh, the second project that we started is a, a training project. Uh, so we are creating a modular uh, uh, training um, for, uh, for MOOC teams in the, in the first place, but it's already decided that we will expand that training model to librarians and also to uh, all lecturers and uh, teaching professors. So the first module was about uh, 
uh, searching, uh, finding, and evaluating uh, OER, and was aimed at MOOC teams. We had the first session on Friday, the 15th of September. And the second module is a bit dependent on the repo repository project, of course, but that will be about creating, unlocking, and sharing OER. The entire training will, in the future, be part of the uh, training offer towards teaching staff of Kaya Leuven. So, um, so I think that's a very interesting uh, project to uh, promote OER in our institution. So I look at the clock and the timing is more or less okay. Um, I can say that what are now the conclusions? I think I'm I'm happy with the work that we did after uh, 20 months in our strategic plan. We are actually doing all the things that we mentioned in the plan. We are working on training program. We are uh, thinking about repository. Um, and on the other hand, I think we have to be realistic that the in initiatives we take now are bottom up and rather small. But um, if a, uh, a lecturer now wants to open up his learning materials, we are now more or less ready to help or to give support. And uh, we are also decide, uh, decided to continue our efforts, probably focusing more on open publication uh, and uh, on, on publication formats we are more familiar with, for instance, such as open textbooks. I think that's a very interesting uh, uh, a choice because we have a, a fund for fair open access. So maybe this could uh, be interesting to uh, try a pilot with an open textbook. Um, so we are realistic that uh, about our uh, 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 that real change is only to be expected when national policy changes. Uh, but we are on our way, and that's why I chose this image, uh, and we will see where this road brings us. So I think here I can uh, end my uh, presentation. Um, I don't know if um, there there is still some time for questions, I think. Thanks, Frederick. Thank you very much for such an informative presentation and for so many interesting issues that you managed to cover. Well, actually, uh, the question which uh, might, might be just from my part, but is uh, like, if there is supposed to be the platform where different open educational resources uh, might be accessed, how are you going to um, put them into different uh, fields, according to like mathematics, open educational resources about mathematics. Or currently I'm uh, uh, trying, uh, just doing the course of forensic linguistic and I'm also interested in that. How could I find and uh, how could you uh, get for sure that people who are interested uh, in that field could reach those resources? Well, it's about uh, the repository question. Uh, it, it's a question about the repository solution. Huh? Uh, well, we are not there yet. Huh? Uh, so I think now we have uh, some educational resources that are uh, stored in uh, the uh, the uh, course management software. And that's actually the issue that it's they, they cannot easily be found so that's what we are uh, trying to figure out how can we make them uh, in the first place maybe um, internally uh, how can we share those resources uh, easily and in the current uh, technical solution that we have now it's not easy to 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 make them findable so so far that's a problem yeah yeah okay thank you I have a question too, and also a comment, if I can, Frederick. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you again for uh, the presentation and uh, for sharing with us your experience, which is uh, very similar in many ways to the path that I've been working myself uh, during the, the last uh, 15 years or so, I would say. Um, first of all, have you considered, well, I have more than one question, actually. The first one is, have you considered as a possible uh, solution duplicating the materials, which is a very 
straightforward way to say that uh, even if you are not, if you don't have a repository, an internal open repository, you can always uh, share mm -hmm. uh, the, the main copy of the resource at the institutional level within the boundaries of the software and the platforms that you have, but then also share a copy of it in a wider and open platform. Have you considered this? Yes, this that well, this is one of the options now. So we are still in the process of uh, requ functional requirements and 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 thinking about software solutions, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's already very clear that that there's no easy solution for for that. So we are there. We know that that it won't be easy. Uh, so that's one of the the options. In 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 indeed making yeah. So sharing internally and sharing openly, yeah? so and making a copy and, and indeed for the, the, the part of where resources can be shared open, indeed make a copy and, and publish them in a, in a platform. So that's one of the, the yes, that's a, uh, it's a very, uh, very likely that that will be one of the, the results of the project, yes. And also, you spoke about, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you spoke about uh, math resources that you would be happy to share and maybe also to look at. And this maybe answers also uh, a little uh, Elena's request. Have you ever uh, explored FET? This is the link to FET repository. Uh, it started as a... a um, repository for uh, simulations okay mm -hmm. and it was only about physics but then it uh, became wider and wider and uh, this is not only a repository where uh, colorado boulder university who is the the managing institution share their resources the, the resources created internally but everyone can share their resources related to now up to five uh, STEM topics uh, such as physics, chemistry, math, earth science, and biology. And mm. the nice thing is that during the COVID pandemic, they went back to the structure of the repository. They rebuilt it completely. And now you can search resources not only by topic, but also by uh, the age of, stud of your students. So mm. that's why I'm suggesting it, because you can also... Uh, look for resources for uh, different uh, grades and uh, uh, you can upload your own resources and share feedback about uh, the resources that you want to reuse, why you are using reusing them and share the practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm talking about the practice also because uh, another resource that uh, uh, came to mind while you were talking is Graspol. Graspol is uh, another repository of uh, resources, mainly uh, based on math and uh, uh, statistics, okay? And um, again, everything is uh, openly shared here for different level, uh, different ages and div different grades. And uh, uh, it's based on exercises. So that's the shift of focus is on practice now. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at your um, uh, the policy, um, the image related to the policy documents that you have in place now about open science, uh, I noticed that, uh, which is uh, wonderful, you have OER in the picture. There is no mention for practices yet. And I think that one of the opportunities, but that's the, the question for you, if you think, if you agree or if you disagree about the importance of focusing our attention also on practices, because sometimes it's uh, through the practice that you link open science and open education. So having practices in the picture can be a good uh, way to, to make connections with the practitioners and to mm -hmm. ignite more discussion between the people involved. At least that's my, my my experience, but I wanted to ask you if uh, you see this as an opportunity to. Yeah, I, I think I think that's that's indeed an opportunity. I think that we have now been really talking about we are we are, have been uh, trying to 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 talk about OER from a more theoretical and strategical uh, point of view, and I think the, the those practical examples. And, and the practices can really help to uh, 
um, to make it more uh, yeah, appealing to, to uh, lecturers and more, con more specific. Yeah. So I think that's definitely something that we, we can take, take along with, with us, yes. Thank you. Is there any other question from members? Oh, Mira, please go ahead, Mira. Mm. Thanks, uh, thanks, Paula. Uh, thanks a lot, Frederick, for sharing your story. It's very relatable and super relevant um, right now for m many of us, I think. Um, my question, I actually have two questions. Um, one of them is uh, how difficult or how easy was it to persuade the library uh, management to make OER one of their, um, yeah, how do you call it, Spearpunten? the you know what i mean the the directions uh, or strategic points that they will be including into the strategic mm -hmm. plan and did you have competition with other topics and if you did how did you go about it um how did you uh, manage to sell uh, the topic of uh, open education so well that it uh, you know it got included into the uh, strategic plan for the library that's one question and another one is um have you already uh, reached out for maybe a closer partnerships or closer cooperations beyond the library within your university. So maybe to the Center for Teaching and Learning or other uh, services uh, that are, you know, um, uh, just uh, really connected uh, to the topic of open education and open practices. So it would be really interesting to hear yes. your thoughts on this subject. Okay. Well, um, it, it went relatively easy to, to integrate uh, OER as a topic for the strategic plan. There was, of course, some discussion and also not, not, we were not sure when we were creating the strategic plan uh, how it would go with, with open educational resources. Um, but the fact that it was uh, at, at that time when we were preparing the strategic plan, uh, the UNESCO recommendation, and also the fact that it was a topic and it, it is a topic in, in uh, several um, uh, international library networks and also questionnaires about open science, uh, more often now also ask about open education. So that helped a little bit, but we were also, um, uh, I think the, the way it was integrated in the plan, um, it, we made it a topic within the concept of open science. So we could go very uh, fast forward with OER or we could go rather slowly with OER. And I think that helped to uh, give it a place in, in, in the plan. But um, it, I, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it, it it went surprisingly well to to integrate it in in, in the plan. Um, there was also discussion about okay, uh, education in the plan should should education be a separate uh, topic in the plan or should be uh, or, or not? Huh? I think uh, and uh, our educational support in the library uh, has has very much been focusing on on um, uh, information literacy learning and and that is a topic and. You, you, we, we had a discussion about um, how can we be uh, innovative concerning education, um, and I, uh, then you have the innovations that you bring into information literacy uh, teaching are actually innovations about teaching. So if, if uh, you have distance learning and the use of uh, artificial intelligence or uh, uh, VR, if, if we want to do something about that, that's actually something that is uh, part of of education and not specifically that library education. But um, so we had some discussions about that. And in, in the end, um, yeah, I, I said, if we want to do something new about education, then I think uh, we could focus on OER. And um, the fact that we could integrate it in, in open science uh, helped in that perspective, I think. Um, and yes, we have uh, some contacts with, with services outside the library. Um, so, uh, for instance, the training modules that we are uh, working on now uh, will be uh, integrated in uh, the uh, teacher professionalization project, the uh, Dienst uh, Onderwijs Ondersteuning, uh, as we say in Dutch. So, uh, uh, so OER will also be a topic there. So, uh, and we have also the, the internal analysis. We have a cooperation with uh, educational policy. So now we are in contact with with uh, that uh, those networks within uh, the university. 
Thanks a lot. It resembles very much the path we are taking or we've been taking this yeah. uh, all along. So I can also relate to, to many of these corporations. Thank you, Frederick. Yeah. Any other question? I would also like one uh, to ask one more question about the quality. Frederick, you mentioned that uh, uh, during, for example, the joint uh, open educational uh, resource uh, with the past of time, you may think about the quality of the resources provided. And who do you think should uh, be responsible for that if, for example, it's a joint project, uh, if you compile, for example, a joint course and who should ensure the quality? And is, is there any kind of requirements to follow uh, and to guarantee uh, the high quality of the resource? Thank you. Well, well I think the, the issue that we had was that we jumped into a collaborative uh, project of, of creating uh, these learning materials and uh, that we didn't have a plan on how to uh, ensure quality on a long, longer term. So. Um, I think that if you start a collaboration to to uh, to co create uh, an open uh, educational resource, or for uh, for instance, the project like like an anatomy tool, for instance, I think there there has to be a long term plan to to uh, to ensure quality on a longer term. And uh, if uh, something is outdated, uh, or or so the, the problem we had was we we. Uh, had that shared shared tutorial, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, yeah, partners, yeah, they made a copy and they made it their own, and they did adaptations. But there was no structure to share uh, on a longer term what adaptations were made, and to to let the community then learn on on how the uh, the resource could evolve. So, and I I think that's that's. I think that's very important in a collaborative project that uh, the long-term sustainability of the resources is discussed uh, the moment you start the collaboration. Yes, thank you. I have also a question. If I, yes. If I may. Uh, Naomi, I work at the Learning Center of University of Upper Alsace, so in north of uh, northeast of France. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you again about um, your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I have a question about the platform you used. Uh, when you talk about tutorials for students, I didn't recognize uh, the platform you used. Uh, I just wanted to know if um, the name of the platform you used, if it was an intern tool, or if I don't understand if, I, if, if it was OER or not. So just about the, the platform you used. So the the tutorial was created actually in Toledo, and that's the the Kai Leuven iteration of the of the Blackboard uh, learning environment. So that's mm -hmm. actually, um, but it, uh, so that's the 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 environment where the uh, the tutorial was created. And so in the beginning, in the beginning, it was an open tutorial, but since we moved it to the Blackboard environment, it was no longer open for all. It's only open for for the the, the partners. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, then. So let me let me thank again Frederick and also Elena for introducing him. And uh, thank you, Frederick, for this very interesting uh, webinar and uh, all the things that you shared with us. I think that uh, it's wonderful for us to listen to other members' experience and that we, we can learn a lot through this. So thank you for being with us and for uh, uh, being so kind to share your experience. If everyone has uh, questions that raise uh, uh, afterwards, here is a Frederick email and uh, we can reach out to you and ask more. <laughs> thank again.